Thank you. Thank you very much, Mahul. Um, I'm very grateful to the organizing committee for the invitation uh, to speak today, uh, and really very grateful to all of you for staying behind. Uh, and I hope to share with you some of the work that we've been doing uh, and where we're headed as well in terms of trying to understand severe childhood obesity. So this is just uh, my first slide uh, reminding me to tell you about Cambridge, where we have an Institute of Metabolic Science, where we undertake some of this work. Uh, and really, the question that we're most interested in is how can we help patients, in particular children, with severe obesity? And we know to try and do that, we need to understand the fundamental mechanisms involved in the regulation of weight. We need to work out how those mechanisms are disrupted to lead to severe obesity. And then we need to translate those findings into trying to find better treatments for patients. Now, the way that we have approached this is to use a number of genetic studies in patients with severe obesity that begins at a very young age. And as you can see from the clinical photos on the right-hand side, these are children who are very heavy. At the age of two, weighing 29 kilos. At the age of five, weighing 50 or 60 kilos. At the age of 10, weighing over 100 kilos. So very severe, life-threatening obesity that begins at a very young age. And our thinking was that in many cases, or in some cases, this may well be genetic. And what we've done is tried to take genetic approaches to try to find the genes that we think may be disrupted in these patients. And the rationale for doing that is if we can find a particular gene or pathway that is disrupted, it allows us to get a tractable approach to what is otherwise a complex and heterogeneous group of disorders. If we can do that, we can try and prove that a mechanism is involved and therefore target it potentially for treatments. And very importantly, I think, trying to understand the cause of obesity in these children is actually important for the children themselves. It is, of course, for any medical condition, but I think particularly so for severe obesity, which is highly stigmatized and which people often fail to consider as having a biological basis. So the framework for thinking about genes really emerged over the last 15, 20 years with the discovery of an entire homeostatic pathway involved in the regulation of weight. And this is effectively a new endocrine circuit Certainly, it didn't exist when I was at medical school. We learned about the thyroid, about growth, about many other parameters, but we didn't know there was a system for regulating weight. And this system is present in, in all mammals and really has emerged from the study of these mice, which um, lack the hormone leptin, its receptor and downstream targets. And what we now know is that the brain is really key, but in particular the hypothalamus, which, which receives inputs from our fat, Fat is there not just to store extra calories, but secretes a number of hormones, including leptin, which circulates in the bloodstream, acts in the brain, and tells us about our long-term energy stores, but also that the brain receives signals from the gut, both neural signals and hormonal signals, which tell us about fullness in relation to meals. Now, all of that information is integrated in the hypothalamus to regulate our weight over long periods of time. And this is a homeostatic process. So most people will maintain their weight in a very steady manner over long periods of time, despite fluctuations in how much we eat and how much energy we expend. Now, focusing in on the hypothalamus, we know that these various hormones, leptin, insulin, ghrelin, and others, act on very specific neurons in the arcuate nucleus of the hypothalamus, where the blood-brain barrier is permeable. Those neurons then project to other parts of the hypothalamus and either increase or decrease food intake. And it's the balance between these signals that will ultimately determine what we eat and how much weight we gain. These neurons then, of course, project to the, the brainstem and other brain regions and ultimately will regulate neuroendocrine function, autonomic function, and even immunity and other parameters. We know that these circuits are important for humans because children in whom these genes are disrupted develop severe obesity. Now, we showed this first with the identification of children who were lacking the hormone leptin, and like those mice which were lacking leptin, these children also develop severe obesity. The key clinical features are that they're of normal birth weight, they're incredibly hungry, they're driven to eat, this is really one of the key clinical features. They're always hungry, they want to eat food, and any kind of food is appetizing. Even English food seems very exciting for them. And clearly, my European colleagues will acknowledge that's an obviously a disorder of appetite. <laughs> so severe hyperphagia, I think, is one of the keys to these genetic obesity syndromes, telling us that these normal pathways aren't working. These children often have impaired satiety, 
They get hungry again very quickly after a meal, and they're asking for food. And these are very key clinical clues that these circuits aren't working. Other features include hypogonadotropic hypogonadism, and otherwise these children look normal and often will develop normally. Now, we were able to show that leptin was involved, but also that giving back leptin to these children could entirely treat their obesity. These are a couple of patients referred by my good colleague, Dr. Leila Akin from Turkey, who identified these two children with severe obesity in whom we found undetectable levels of leptin and homozygous mutations, which completely disrupt the leptin gene. 12 months after treatment with recombinant human leptin, these are the same two children, and you can see complete reversal of their severe life-threatening obesity. And in studies of these children and others with leptin deficiency, what we learned is the major effect of leptin is on appetite. So even after a few days of giving leptin injections, the eating behavior of these children completely changes. They now start turning away food, and they have a dramatic reduction, even normalization, in their appetite. Over the years, we've then gone on to show that the pathways downstream of leptin in the hypothalamus uh, are also important in human obesity, as other children have been found with mutations in these pathways. As I mentioned, a key feature of these patients is hypogonadotropic hypogonadism, and certainly leptin appears to be a key signal for the regulation of the onset of puberty. We know that when we treat these children with leptin, they'll go through puberty, but in an appropriate developmental stage. And we now have a number of adults who have completed their pubertal development, uh, and in fact, the, uh, with the oldest the patient that we've been treating for the longest, I've recently had to have a discussion about contraception, something I never imagined we would be doing uh, in leptin deficiency. So downstream of leptin, one of the key other genes that I wanted to talk to you about was the melanocortin-4 receptor, because a number of groups, including ourselves, have identified mutations in this gene. And this gene is important because actually these are heterozygous mutations, and they don't affect fertility. These children actually look remarkably well, other than they're very heavy. And we find these mutations in about 5% of our cohort of severe obesity in about 2 to 3% of a childhood obesity clinic. And what we're doing with these mutations is a number of things. We can study them at a molecular level, and we can show that many of the mutations prevent this G-protein coupled receptor from getting to the surface of the cell, but also that this is a really key control point for appetite. So the patients who have a more severe mutation that doesn't work at all in cells have a more severe clinical phenotype. And we can show this even at the level of appetite, uh, where they certainly eat more than other children with um, a different kind of mutation. And this is important because over the number of years, we've been working with colleagues on trying to find drug targets for this receptor. And very recently now, there's a compound that we're working on with Rhythm Pharmaceuticals, which is a melanocortin-4 receptor agonist, which we hope to be in phase two clinical trials in the very near future, targeted at this group of patients with obesity due to MC4R mutations. The challenge will be to try to identify the right patients and the right mutations who will benefit, and this requires us organizing all of the molecular data and the clinical data and trying to then understand which patients respond uh, better than others. But I think finally some interest and excitement that we may have some treatments based on an increased understanding of the biology that underlies the obesity in these children. Of course, sometimes, and I think all physicians recognize this, it's not just the problems that the patient has that makes us think about what's going on, it's actually the problems that they don't have. Now, I mentioned that many of the MC4 children, for example, um, are pretty well, they look fine, and many of them don't get the complications we associate with obesity. In fact, we also found that the leptin and the leptin receptor children have very normal blood pressures, in fact, even low blood pressures, despite severe obesity. And indeed, when we did some extensive studies with MC4R mutations, uh, we clearly see that a reduced prevalence of hypertension as adults uh, and really very normal systolic and blood pressures as adults of a mean of 122 over 72 in adults with a BMI of 45. So these patients are protected from hypertension and indeed anecdotally also from cardiovascular disease. And working with colleagues uh, studying mice, we now think that actually this is a key pathway not only for regulating weight, but for linking weight to blood pressure. We've known for a long time, of course, that the two things are coupled. As people gain weight, their blood pressure goes up. If they lose weight, their blood pressure comes down. How are these two things connected? And it seems to be through the leptin melanocortin circuit. So if I can just take you through this slide, the way that we think about this is that leptin coming from adipose tissue 
acts in the brain through the MC4 receptor to ultimately affect food intake and energy expenditure, but also to regulate blood pressure through the sympathetic nervous system. And what we've been able to show in animals by knocking it down, by deleting the gene, but also in patients who lack these genes, that effectively, if you um, increase fat mass, as people gain weight, you have more leptin. As you have more leptin, you have an increased signal through the MC4 receptor, and you increase blood pressure. And when we delete some key aspects of this pathway, you find that you don't get this signal. The patients, for example, who are lacking MC4 won't get this signal, and so you don't drive up blood pressure. And this, I think, is, is pretty clear evidence now that this is the circuit that links weight to blood pressure, and it's perhaps not insulin resistance and other things which have often been linked uh, to this um, physiology. So what are we doing now? Well, we still have an awful lot to do because to date the genes that we found only explain 7% of the patients in our goose cohort. We think there's quite a lot of genes to find purely by nature of the clinical features of those patients. So we're doing two things. Broadly speaking, we continue to look at new candidate genes, genes that we know are involved in the regulation of weight, trying to see if some patients may have mutations in those genes. And we have found a number in the last year or two which are all modulating that same pathway that we've already um, studied. But in addition to that, we're finding novel genes through a number of approaches, and in particular using whole exome sequencing, where we now not only screen one gene at a time, but we can screen all of the 19,000 genes um, in a person's exome in, in one experiment effectively. And I was hoping that we might find a few new genes and that would keep us happy for a little while, give us something to do. What I didn't expect is that we're finding many, many genes. So first of all, we're just trying to look at genes that we think have a good reason to be involved in obesity, and that is genes that we know cause obesity in mice. And there are about 95 of those genes. And in about 60 of them, we found mutations in patients that, were, that are completely novel and could affect function. So this is quite a difficult task because we're finding a lot of mutations. Of course, you also get genetic variants in controls. So the challenge is to see which of these are meaningful. But I think generally this speaks to the fact that severe childhood obesity is very heterogeneous and has a complex genetic architecture with different genes possibly being involved in different patients. What we've decided to do is try to take a focused approach and pull out some of the genes that we're most interested in, but also the genes that I think would make the best drug targets, because ultimately we want to use this knowledge to try to find ways to help the patients. So we're focusing on a number of genes, some of which are, are for which there are already drugs available, but for which we may find evidence that they're important in human physiology. So one example I just wanted to share with you is a new gene that we've been interested in called KSR2. And we were interested in this gene because when it's deleted in mice, the mice are very fat, as you can see over here. Uh, they're actually bigger than MC4 mice. And as an adult patient with a homozygous MC4 mutation would be about 230 kilos, that made me think this could be quite an important gene potentially for patients who might present with severe obesity. But also we were interested because this gene is involved in a really fundamental pathway involved in cell division, cell growth, and differentiation. And we know that mutations in this pathway, the ras raf mech erk pathway, are involved in 30% of human cancers and in merry developmental syndromes such as Noonan syndrome. So this is a fundamental pathway that links growth with nutrient sensing. And what KSR2 does in this pathway is it sits in the cytoplasm and it pulls together many of the components of this pathway, allowing the signal from external hormones, such as growth factors, insulin, leptin, et cetera, to get through to the nucleus and regulate gene expression. We found a number of patients with mutations in KSR2 that were not found in any controls and we went on to study those mutations in cells, we can show that the mutations don't actually affect where KSR2 is located in the cell, but they do affect its signaling. And so many of the mutations will disrupt the ability of KSR2 to interact and signal through other molecules. One of the other things that we can measure is how the mutations in KSR2 affect nutrients, because essentially this is a key part of this pathway. And all of the mutations affect glucose oxidation compared to the normal gene shown with the red arrow. And many of them affect fat oxidation when you measure that in cells. When we see the patients, 
Actually, the patients look quite different to the leptin and the MC4 patients. Here's one of our patients, in fact, the first patient referred by Julian Shields in Bristol um, with a KSR2 frame shift mutation, a heterozygous mutation. So these patients have hyperphagia, but actually for the first time, they also have a reduced basal metabolic rate. They actually have a really slow metabolic rate. It's almost like they're hypothyroid, but their thyroid function is normal. They even have a slow heart rate. On average, adults have a pulse, a fasting uh, heart rate of 60 beats per minute. So this looks like a fundamental slow metabolic rate, which fits very much with what we think KSR2 is doing in the cell, regulating fundamental metabolism. Interestingly, many of the patients have severe insulin resistance and acanthosis nigricans, uh, and in fact, that's led to a number of the referrals to us. This is disproportionate for the degree of obesity, and again, may be linked with the fact that insulin can signal through this pathway. A number of the patients, in fact, some of the original patients um, referred to us by Peter Heinmarsh, um, had been treated with metformin at a very young age because of their severe insulin resistance, and unexpectedly, they lost a lot of weight. Now, of course, some children will lose weight with metformin, but these children actually have lost much more weight than we would expect, and we think they're particularly sensitive to metformin. And we think there's a reason for this, which we're now exploring in cells, is that KSR2 seems to link with AMP kinase, the sort of battery of the cell, the fuel sensor that generates ATP. And we know that metformin does many things, but one of the things metformin seems to do, at least in, in, in liver cells, is also modulate AMPK. And so we think there's a link between KSR2 and metformin, which may mean that these patients are particularly responsive to this very old-fashioned uh, drug of ours. Now, one of the things that we're trying to do is understand how this occurs, and in cells, we can actually show that metformin can rescue the defect in fatty acid oxidation. So in the red uh, arrow is the, is the normal uh, gene, the normal KSR2. The white bar is in the basal state, fatty acid oxidation, and metformin can increase fatty acid oxidation uh, when you have a normal KSR2 gene. When you have a patient with a mutation in cells, the reduction, uh, you see a basal reduction in fatty acid oxidation, which is normalized when you add metformin to the cells. So a little early clue, something that we're now following up, as to how this interaction is actually working. And ultimately, it might allow us not only to see if this drug is useful for this group of patients, uh, but also to learn more about metformin uh, and how it actually works. And interestingly, these metabolic effects are things that we have traditionally always associated with muscle and liver, but in fact, KSR2 is really only expressed in the brain. And so it seems that brain pathways can affect these fundamental aspects of our metabolism. But of course, we don't know anything at all about where KSR2, it's widely expressed in the brain, but which pathways are involved and how, they, how and if they link to leptin, for example, we don't understand. So this is really a, a challenge for us, is to take these genes and these findings and try and put it together to understand these circuits that clearly regulate energy balance. But understanding the circuits, of course, is one thing, but we then need to try and understand how these circuits influence other phenotypes. Clearly, we understand a bit about how they regulate hormones, for example, and autonomic function. But one of the interesting other aspects, which we've known about for a long time, is that the hypothalamus is intricately linked to other brain regions, such as the amygdala, which regulate behavior. And we're beginning to find that some of these genes that cause severe obesity in children can also cause unusual behaviors. I just want to share two examples of that. The first is SIM1. This is a gene that's involved in the MC4 pathway uh, in which we found a number of mutations which affect function when studied in cells. And the patients look quite a lot like the MC4 patients. Um, they again have lowish blood pressures, autonomic dysfunction. But interestingly, these patients have autistic type features. They're emotionally quite labile. The first patient I saw, the reason I thought of this was that she was six years old and she tried to bite me when I tried to take blood from her. I mean, they don't usually bite me when I take blood, but so I thought this was a little bit unusual. Um, but they're quite emotionally labile. They'll be fine one minute, the next minute they'll attack the dog. They'll do strange things. Um, they also are relatively socially isolated. They like to play alone. They like to have a certain routine, always go to school the same way. And interestingly, these behaviors also relate to food. So they'll always like to have the food in a certain pattern on the plate. They'll only have cheese mixed with pasta, not cheese on top of pasta. 
So it's very unusual, very kind of what we often call autistic type behaviors, which can override the hyperphagia uh, that we see. So we have some clues as to what may be causing this, and one of the, the potential explanations is oxytocin, which in mice uh, can certainly cause some of those behaviors, but we need to try and study it in the patients. Uh, and the other way in which I think some of these circuits influence behavior is, again, something we've known about probably for 100 years in animals, is that the hypothalamus has always been involved in aggression. Uh, and we've got a group of patients here in whom we found mutations in a gene called SH2B1. So we've showed that these mutations affect the function of the molecule, so their loss of function mutations. Um, but clinically, when we took the histories from the patients and, in fact, saw some of the patients, many of them had to a degree, speech and language delay, but a number of them were socially isolated and aggressive. Um, and in fact, they wouldn't come forward for testing. A number of them, as in their teenage years and as adults, um, had either been arrested, had a history of drug abuse. Um, and this was really out of keeping with both the social class, but also other patients that we've seen. So of course, you could say this is difficult to pin this as causality and quite concerning and has some implications if we try and imply that. Um, but this is something that we're following up further with more behavioral phenotyping because actually it's very consistent as we find these patients that many of them have a history of outbursts of aggression, that one minute they'll be fine and the next minute they'll attack something. Uh, they also seem to be fearless. They have no concept of danger. Uh, and interestingly, we're working with the chap who has the mice that lack this gene and the mice also display aggressive behavior uh, and seem to be fearless. So a little bit of a complicated area that we're getting to, um, but I think it does remind us of some classical endocrinology, uh, but also how that might manifest uh, in some patients. Uh, and really finally, just uh, as a word of, of course we're looking mostly at genes at the moment, but we know that we're only scratching the surface because there's a lot of variation that is not in the coding genes. So this is non-coding RNAs. And of course, one example of that is Prader-Willi syndrome, which many of us have been interested in for, for, for years, and of course, uh, for which uh, this society has a, has a long history too. And Prader-Willi syndrome, we've known for a long time, is in, uh, caused by deletions on the imprinted region of chromosome 15. But interestingly, it actually doesn't appear to be any of the genes on this region, but in fact, a family of non-coding RNAs. So we've recently been able to narrow down the critical region because we found some patients with a very small deletion who look just like Prader-Willi syndrome with the growth failure, the hypergonadism, um, the obesity, but it seems to be down to one family of non-coding RNAs which regulate a family of genes, which therefore could cause a number of clinical phenotypes. So really, I just want to conclude with leaving it there, much more with um, a lot more that we have to find uh, to try and explain severe childhood obesity in many of these patients. But we can show that rare high penetrant genes, uh, genetic variants, can cause severe childhood obesity. And through the study of those patients, we can learn a lot about the pathways that are involved. And the fact that many of our patients are different um, may well be telling us about the mechanisms and how different mechanisms are relevant for different groups of patients. Uh, and ultimately, to try and really understand these problems, we need to work not only together, but actually looking at multiple different approaches to handle complex problems. And I really want to finish by thanking a number of people uh, who are involved in a lot of this work, in particular my team, um, who've done a lot of the studies and very much want to open the way for other youngsters who may want to come and work with us, both basic scientists and clinical scientists, as I think there's a, a huge amount of work that we still need to do. Um, but importantly, to thank our many colleagues and collaborators around the world, and importantly, at this meeting, I really wanted to take the opportunity to thank many of you who've collaborated with us over many years with a study that really started off in the UK and has, we've recruited really across Europe and indeed across the world. And it's really by knowing about these patients who are relatively rare that we can really identify these very complex mechanisms. And really, this was my chance to thank all of you at SB for your longstanding collaboration. Um, and finally, really, I wanted to leave the last word to the patients. Uh, this is one of our patients with an MC4R mutation who we identified at the age of four and is now at the age of 10. It's quite nice to see that she was doing some fundraising for us, uh, although I must admit it was with a cake sale. Um, she keeps wanting to do cake sales to raise money for us, which is quite sweet. Um, but really, she puts this very nicely in terms of the implications of our research. Because, of course, we're focused on understanding the mechanisms because so that one day we can try and find treatments for these patients. And, of course, they would like us to find treatments. 
But actually, I think the most important thing that they tell me that where they benefit from this work and, and from our findings is actually just the fact that we understand or are trying to understand what is going on and that we are not judgmental and that we're trying to, we recognize that we don't understand very much, but at least we're trying to look into it. And I think that for us as physicians, that's I think a really important take home message. I just wanna also flag um, our webs website for anybody who's interested in our papers, but also how to refer a patient. But also importantly, it has some information for patients that you may be seeing. And um, with that, I'd like to thank you very much.